read me romance read read me romance read me romance read read me romance you could take a look in a book that's fine or you could sit back relax and unwind and read me romance read read me romance welcome back lady listeners hey what's up what's up we have got Gianna Darling out of sight this week. We're going to play the second installment for you in just a little bit. But we're going to catch up, read some lady listener emails, all kinds of good stuff. Um, Halloween's this weekend. Are you guys doing anything? Yes. What are you doing? I'm going out of town. Where are you going? <laughs> <laughs> You're like, yes, I'm doing something. I'm leaving my fucking family. <laughs> Remember, I was supposed to go to um, Houston like months and months ago. Yeah, I yeah. moved it because mm-hmm. like it gotten crazy with COVID in Dallas and or yeah. in Texas. Mm-hmm. So I had moved it to Halloween weekend because that's like Celia's biggest, my girlfriend's like favorite holiday. Like our whole yard is like ridiculous. I love it. So, but I don't know. I feel like she wants me to cancel because Why? she said to me the other day, because this is what she said to me. This is what she said. Okay. She goes, I was like, she's like, how are you feeling? I'm like, I'm feeling better. Da, da, da. And I was like, she's like, well, I can't wait to see you. Um, I decided I'm going to have a party on Saturday and then we'll do Halloween stuff on Sunday. And I was mm-hmm. like, you're going to have a party? <laughs> <laughs> so that's why you think she doesn't want you to come. She's purposely trying to push you away. Yeah. Because so she's inviting like, people even to her like, house. She kind like, of what's said, wrong with you? She kind of said that to me like when I was sick. And then uh-huh. I remember, like, when I started to get better, I randomly texted her. I was like, did you say you were having a party? And she's <laughs> like, I was like, I'm, I'm not playing. I was like, I woke up. And, like, that was my first thought. I was like, oh, my God, she's having a party when I'm there. That sneaky like, bitch that's, got you. That's my panic, <laughs> though. Like, my first morning mm-hmm. panic. I always panic when I first wake up. And I'm like, there's a party. That's normal. <laughs> <laughs> and she's like, don't worry about it. And change the subject. I'm like, I don't know. I don't You're know like, God this. damn it. She got me. She got me. <laughs> Why are you? I don't know. I'm, I'm coming over. Why are you planning a party? I'm well, like, how long on a Sunday? So, yeah, we're having a party on Saturday, too. I'm like, but, well, you no, know, I like the people that are coming. So I'm not upset about it. I'm just saying, you know, I'm coming over. I'm like, you're not th- I've canceled twice on you before. <laughs> I will cancel third time so fast. <laughs> <laughs> I check it out easy, okay? It doesn't uh-huh. take much to get will me to you, cancel a trip. Will you know anybody else besides her? Well, Peyton's coming with me. My son's coming. Oh, okay. Well, that's not too bad then. Well, he'll probably yeah. love it. Yeah, he will. He's not like me. He's like, he's an introverted extrovert what is that like he loves to be home mm-hmm. but he's not shy like if we go somewhere i'll mm-hmm. talk to anybody and everybody yeah I so like whatever that. that is he's got the best of you and rob both though yeah, i love so. that <clears throat> so we have halloween we've already decorated our yard it's insanity like the i don't i wish my family had this much enthusiasm with christmas because let me tell you, when I talk about putting up Christmas trees, everybody ghosts me. But all of a sudden, we talk about pulling out dead bodies and corpses and stuff, and everybody's like, "Yes, let's go to the basement. Let's haul some shit." I don't know. So, um, are you dressing up? I don't know. This you're just not excited about this at all. Damn. Like I, I thought about it. Like I was gonna buy an outfit and stuff, but literally, like when I was looking at stuff to buy, I that's when I got sick. So now I'm like, oh, yeah. coming around to still being tired, and I'm like, I don't want to look for a costume. So I'm just <laughs> like, I'll probably panic buy something next week. Yeah, what I'm definitely. feeling definitely better, and I'm like, oh no. <laughs> and you'll have to like pay three times as much on Amazon because it's the week before Halloween. <laughs> we, um, my family and I, we always do a group costume, and so this year we d- all decided on Adventure Time. It's a cartoon. We did it before before Hallie was born, and she found out, oh and she God. was like, oh no, we're redoing this. I can't. You guys can't do Adventure Time without me because that's our that's like their favorite cartoon ever. I love that. Yeah. So we're having to redo it because of her this year. So I never get to pick. It's never my choice because I always say I want to do Harry Potter and nobody agrees with me. Peyton is um, a plague doctor. What? Yeah. Oh, like the big mask? Like the yes. long pointy mask? Yes. yes. That's awesome. He is a plague doctor. I love it. That's, that's ball. It's weird. Right I'm now. like, okay. <laughs> 
kind of fucked up. I love Remember it. Remember that time he got that one outfit that cost like a hundred bucks, but it blew up with the bubble. Yeah, yeah. and, and he, he was like the bubble boy. Thing, like I was like, I can't believe I spent a hundred dollars on this thing. He wore that thing for wore the months. shit out of it. Wore the oh, shit out of it. It was like I don't even question this Halloween costumes anymore. When they cost a little bit, I'm like, <laughs> you you it. wear them. I don't. Even... Mm-hmm. I love it. I love it. All right, I've got some lady listener emails, and some of these um, are recent. Some of them are way back when. Apparently, we asked for proposal stories at one point. So if you have a great proposal story, send it to us. We'll read it. Read me romance at gmail.com. Um, this one is entitled The Whole Story. So last week, we had Isla Glass, and she mentioned that her book was based off of porn. And I was like, what the fuck? You have to elaborate on that. So she emailed us and said, this is the whole story. Leah wanted to tell you the whole story about the inspiration behind the submission series. Here it is. So, yes, it was inspired by a porn commercial. I was on Belisa, B-E-L-L-E-S-A. Sounds like Belicia. A porn website that someone that emailed the podcast suggested. Oh, yeah. Somebody said it's a porn website for women. Oh, okay. So, yeah. Anyway, above the video, there is usually an ad for another porn website. Belisa has porn from their own company as well as others. One of them is called Deeper. An ad for Deeper was playing. I was a li- It was a little clip of the same scene. It went from a naked blonde on a bed, a man coming in. There is a harp. She is on a bench tied up. He is soaking her. They fuck against the harp and some other stuff. <laughs> the, the sounds, this sounds complicated. It sounds complicated. <laughs> I'm tired reading this. <laughs> so it made me want to do a light BDSM book featuring someone playing an instrument. So Mary's submission and Julia's desire are from that. Mary is the blonde and Julia plays the harp and they both get spanked and fucked dirty. And I figured Mary and Julia needed more friends. So I gave them Jasmine and Violet. I tried really hard to make all four friends different. All the other stuff I've done is really standalone. I don't really give my characters friends, but I think I managed it in this series. Mary is extroverted, bratty, and fun. Jasmine is great A and serious. Julia is shy and introvert, and Violet is a little mix of all of them. A little shy, but not introverted, and likes a little fun, but not a lot. I'm really excited to write her story. She is going to have a daddy book with her principal. Mm -hmm. I love so check out all the glass in that whole series so that was awesome like i i love that that was what it was based off of when she told us so it's hard um, to give heroines friends because then they're like you're being stupid <laughs> didn't we talk about that one time where it was like you, you in real life your best friend wouldn't let you do some of the stupid shit heroines do in this nope. so yeah like it's hard to give them a here uh, a heroine a best friend because She's best friends up their ass. The best friends like, shut the fuck down. Are you out of your mind? Yeah. (laughs) But the best stories are made by doing stupid fucking shit. So, Mm -hmm. all right. This one's entitled Growly Man. And it says, hi, I have never felt compelled to write into a group before, but I need to share this with you. First, I have been living in Germany for the past year and I will be here for another two to five years. I don't speak or read the language. And that means six months of suffering without any books to read. Finding your podcast was like finding the grail. Oh, all of you are hilarious. And I love getting your recommendations for new audiobooks. Like all of you, a growly alpha male is apparently my type and is the reason for this email. I had to share my recent discovery. I have never heard you mention this on your show. So maybe you're not aware. There's a show called Ted Lasso on Apple TV that you have to watch. It's about an American football coach played by Jason Sudeikis, who was hired by a British football club to be known as the club manager. That's the soccer team. The reason you should watch this is for the character of Roy Kent. Oh my gosh. I cannot even tell you how amazing this character is. I have never been so attacked, attracted to a fictional character before. Roy Kent growls. That's all I'm going to say. Enjoy and you're welcome, Selena. So everyone has told me to watch this show. Mm-hmm. Everyone. And that's probably why I haven't done it initially but now i my tv for whatever reason it's a smart it's a google tv yeah and you can't download apple like my my tv has all the apps on it 
So it has like Netflix and Disney and HBO and Amazon. All of that's on there. But you cannot download the Apple app because it's a fucking Google TV. Yeah. So I have to buy an Apple thing and plug it into my TV. And I, it's just, it's too many steps. So yeah. eventually I'll figure out how to watch this fucking show. But I haven't yet. So if you know how, please tell me. Wait. No, that's probably a stupid question. What? Who Apple doesn't own any of like the Xboxes or Playstations or something? Um, I don't think so, but like on any normal TV, you can watch it on it. So like okay. but it's just that mine is set up as like a, you can talk to my TV. Okay. Like it's like it, it's a Google thing where you're like, Hey, um, find me, you know, the show Ted Lasso and it just comes up middle finger. So <laughs> like yeah, yeah, I don't know. But like I'm sure another, maybe another TV in our house could do it, but the one we watch TV on isn't. And so, I don't know. but I do want to watch it because everybody's been telling me how fucking great it is. It's a really feel good show. I know. I've heard the same thing. Yeah. All right. This one's entitled Office Romance, Fall Fun, Feet and Audio, Fall Fun Feet and Audio Mishaps. I have one of each. <laughs> you may remember me as the one who got pearls for Christmas instead of a ring and made him trade them for a microwave. We wrote that story about, didn't we write? We wrote a book about that. Well, I don't even remember what fucking book it was now. Jesus, that was so long ago. Oh God, God, what was that book we I wrote? I don't know. They were, were they married? Oh, it was the one where they were like young and then yes. she had, they, he had the sister. He had all the sisters. He had three sisters, and they were, someone is screaming at us right now. At our own to this book. podcast, they're like, "You stupid fucking idiots!" God damn it! Hold on, I gotta look now. God damn, it. I'm gotta go to our website. Hold on, alexariley.com. Shit, what was the name of that book? I cannot believe we don't fucking know it. Oh, the, the loyal groom. Was it the loyal? Was it that? It was it. Yeah. Yeah, that was it. Okay, Rosie okay. comes from a affluent family, expects her. Blah, blah, blah. Darren works all the time to give his wife the perfect life because it had the one with the pocket watch. Yes. Oh, that was her granddad's. Oh my God. I cannot believe we. <laughs> that was so sweet. Oh my God. Oh, so this is her. She inspired that story. Okay. Now that that's out of the way, sentence one. <laughs> <laughs> she said, Yep, still here. <laughs> It was like she knew I was going to look it up. Office romance, airworthy. The office is where we started. I was a person who reviewed items. He was a processing person. He came over to my desk one day and asked a question. I said, insert snotty voice. I answered that question last week. You need to return to your desk and review your notes. He said, that was Tom. My name is Scott. And if you can't tell us apart, we need to spend more time together. Oh. <laughs> I'm sorry. There is some big dick energy in here right now. Hold on. A few days later at the company picnic, I gave him a ride home and we ended up at my place. Oops. <laughs> oh, she writes the best emails. We snuck around for a few weeks and then came clean with the boss who laughed and said, like we all didn't already know. That was summer 1990. Fall fun, maybe too racy. I'll leave it up to you. I haven't reread that. I haven't pre read this, so I'm just going to read it. Let's go. One year we went to Oktoberfest. I don't drink beer, so he went to beer booths and I went to gifts and crafts and food. Best of both worlds. Mm -hmm. All day we kept bumping into each other, crossing the street or changing from one booth to another. When we finally got ready to go home, we were so ready to get it on that he pulled behind the buildings and pulled off my dress and we did it right there up against the Flamingo Muriel. <laughs> I love them so much. I love this couple. Ah, uh, October. <laughs> That's what she said on here. All right, this is audio mishap. Very airworthy. I was listening to a podcast on my car stereo and picked up my son he is full grown adult at 26, by the way. I paused the podcast and we did some errands and then we got back in and I started the car and like it always does. God damn it. Right it automatically started playing, but I was backing up and for some crazy reason, my controls on the car won't let me stop the podcast while in reverse. My shit does that. My shit does that. Because well, I've done it before with the kids where I'm like, fuck, and I have to like put it in park and turn it off. Anyways, God, he heard, he heard the words. 
She ran her hand down the full length before I hit pause. <laughs> Gross, mom. I said, what? She ran her hand down the full length of the banister. She went down the stairs. What were you thinking? <laughs> Enjoy, Julie. I love her. I want emails from her for the rest of my life. That's so good. Oh, I love it. All right. This says, not quite a proposal. Hi, ladies. I love your show. I never really reach out, uh, out, but on Facebook, you ask for proposals. Though I don't have an interesting proposal, I thought I would tell you my wedding. Quick background. I have been with my husband 10 years this October, and we have been together since I was 17. We decided to get married after being together for six years. I'm kind of a weird one. I didn't want a wedding, and I'm not much of a romantic despite loving romance novels. His mom, however, was devastated because she only had three boys and the oldest eloped and the middle will never marry. Trust me, it's true. <laughs> <laughs> she is talking shit. She talked me into a Vegas wedding. That way she gets a little wedding. I get Vegas. LOL. Someone, me, should have looked up how weddings are. <laughs> I know by movies that you're supposed to walk down the aisle slow or something. Well, Let's just say I got bored of that halfway through and walked the rest of the way normal. <laughs> I'm being sure this is great. I thought I was supposed to say, I, I thought all I was, was, was supposed to say was I do. Then we get to go. Nope. I kept giggling at the sappy speech and the, minister, the minister had, which she had to call me adorable in the middle because I kept interrupting my own wedding. <laughs> I got, I got to the point of vows and was not prepared to be put on the spot. I love you, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> sounds like some shit you do. I know. Yeah, I love you, I guess, was my vows. Yeah. <laughs> the minister and his parents laughed. My awesome husband laughed it off. And when it was his turn, said, I love you too, I guess. <laughs> That's now our thing. His parents still laugh at it. His mom still says it was a very joy, I guess, her a joy thing to do. Um, uh, and it wasn't, and wasn't mad, thank God. Thanks for listening and reading to me ramble, Joanne. Oh my God, that's so cute. <laughs> I love that. I just, I, I adore every bit of that. That's so freaking, because I can just picture it all in my mind. That's so cute. I never thought about weddings. God, about your kids getting married. Have you ever thought about that? Mm. If you want one? Uh, I don't know. I hope that, I don't know. I haven't, I don't know that I've thought about it. I've thought about them as adults in relationships. And that's what worries me. You know what I <laughs> forgot the about that happened the other day? I know this is a little off topic from this. But you know mm -hmm. how I've always, like, I thought, I, um, I always wish my daughter was girly or I had a girl mm -hmm. and I could dress her up and all mm -hmm. this stuff. And then I seen pictures of homecoming of some other people's kids. Mm -hmm. And the daughter's dress was, like, latex. <laughs> mom. And so you're seeing the like, other side of this. <laughs> and I was like... Thank God, because I could not imagine. I do not want to have the talk where my daughter, where I'm like, you can't wear that. Yep. yep. I don't want to say that to my daughter. I never I want know. to make her feel like she she can wear whatever mm -hmm. the fuck she wants. Yep. Is what I want to say. But I'm like, mm -hmm. you know, now I'm like, this is the other side of having a tomboy. I'm never going to have to have that conversation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. It's such a fine line between body autonomy and also like protecting yourself and you know, it's, it's so, it's one of those things that I just hope I never shame them. Because me and Rob <laughs> even started to get into it a little bit when I showed him mm. the picture of the girl. And he's like, no, I would put my foot down. I was like, I don't know. We might bite. Yeah. I said, I don't know. I don't know where I would stand mm -hmm. on this. I would, this is too hard. I can't do it. I'm glad I don't have to. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And you know, like at that age, you know, it's not, it's a hard concept to understand mm -hmm. that it's like, you know, body positivity doesn't have to mean being naked. You know, it, it can also be body positive can be covering yourself entirely. Like it, you know, does one doesn't correlate with the other, but at a young age, like you may not even recognize your own body as sexual, you know, you might have sexual urges, but you might not understand that you're a sexual, you look sexual, you know, yeah. like that just, I don't think those two things go together. And it, I don't know. I'm just so fucking terrified. 
<laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I still have, I'm in a rage from like high school and being told I couldn't wear certain things or mm-hmm. things were inappropriate that really were not inappropriate. Yeah, yeah. Like when I think back on them, I like get a mad rage inside my chest. Yeah. And it's yeah. crazy. I'm like, God, why am I so pissed? <laughs> I got in trouble so many times at school for short shorts. Mm-hmm. Like, and I was just like, what? I, I, had, I was this size in high school. I'm like, what are you worried about? You think I'm going to turn everybody on in here? Trust me. It's not happening. God. Uh, okay. This one says proposal story. Hey, lady DJs. We live in a very small town with a volunteer fire department. During our summer festival, my husband stopped the parade and jumped off the fire truck to propose to me in the middle of the street by the center of town with all the fanfare and the lights and sirens. Jesus Christ, this is sweet. It was very sweet gesture as we were surrounded by our family and friends, but I unfortunately looked like a hot mess. <laughs> I had been working in the fire department concession stands making burgers and fries. I still had an apron on and was covered in grease. The local newspaper took a full cover picture, color picture, and put it on the front page, of course. He looked so nice in his dress uniforms, and I looked like a total scrub. Thanks for everything you ladies do. Take care, Marcy. <laughs> That's some shit my husband would do. Like, like fucking shit. Making this beautiful grand gesture and I look terrible. <laughs> Obviously, we know what's the most important thing here. <laughs> this says, not so elaborate proposal. Hold on, wait. Let me read this up. This is a little bit shorter. Proposal. Hey, ladies. I'm a new listener, but I've gone through almost all of your podcasts in the last week and a half. I love listening to you guys. My proposal story isn't really elaborate or embarrassing, but it's really cute. My husband is a very simple type of guy, and I had no idea that he was going to propose since we had only ever talked about marriage as a possibility one day, but he was kind of against it. He planned it out six months in advance and got my sister and his mom to help him pick the ring. He also tricked me into going downstairs one day at my parents' house so he could ask for their blessing, which is beyond amazing to me. The day he proposed was his golden birthday. He was 26 on the 26th, and he decided that he wanted to take his special day and make it about me instead. So he sent me over to my parents' house with a fake excuse about needing to help them plan their vacation. I stayed there a couple of hours, and then I came back home. When I walked up to the house, there was a sign on the door. It said, come inside, turn on the light, and turn around. So I went inside, and it was dark except for candles on the table where I could see that he had set up a candlelit dinner for us. I still didn't realize what was going on, so I went inside and flipped on the switch and turned around. When I did, I saw that he had written on the wall in glow in, glow in the dark stars, marry me, question mark. I was shocked, and when I turned back around, he was on—he was behind me on one knee with the ring in his hand. I didn't believe it at first. I had to ask him a couple of times if it was for real or a joke. <laughs> oh, well, he's a kidder, but has never done anything like this. Of course, once I realized he was serious, I immediately said yes. Fifteen months later, we got married, and now we have been married for almost two years and are trying for a baby. I love this man with all of my heart, and I'm so happy we found each other. Go fuck mm-hmm. your day up, Lauren. Why do I want to cry? That was so <laughs> Because there's something about, <sighs> you know, not like even me. I'm like, it's just a piece of paper. But then sometimes at the same time, I'm like, I want everybody to know we are fucking in this. You know yeah. what I mean? When you well, get to that point where you're like, you know, maybe it is a piece of paper, but I want everybody to know this mm-hmm. is serious. This is my person. Yeah. And even in that email, it were even it wasn't about the wedding. It was about the gesture of saying, mm-hmm. I pick you. I choose you forever. Yeah. You know, I, just, I never uh, thought I, I told you it. I didn't think I'd ever want to do this. But mm-hmm. yes, with you, you are the one person I do. Yeah. I say that, you know, I, I know I'm sure I talked about it before, but, you know, I never wanted to get married. I never wanted to have kids. I was totally against it until I met my husband. Yep. And when I met him, I was like, oh, fuck. Like, it took a lot of, like, realization a long time later that I didn't – I told myself I didn't want those things because I was afraid I might never get them. That's and then – interesting. Yeah. yeah because I was so terrified that it wouldn't happen. So if I didn't want it, then I couldn't be let down by it. 
I remember with my ex, God, it's so terrible that I was like on birth control and he like the condom broke and I went and got a morning after pill. That's how freaked out I was. Wow. And I was married to him. And then I got with Rob and I was like a sloppy mess, not taking my birth control, (laughs) accidentally pregnant. I was like, that's how you know. Like, you knew you're like, this isn't it. This isn't it. I can't have, I told him I'm never having kids. And Mm -hmm. then I get with Rob and I'm like, yeah. Oops. (laughs) <laughs> Oops. <laughs> guess Looks we're, like we're having them, guess we're a family. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it also took, you know, finding the right person mm-hmm. to where I knew I could rely on them. I knew they'd be a great father. I knew that I wouldn't have to do it on my own. That was something that I, I really just know I think it would work. Cause I remember the first guy I was with, like I was like, he's a good guy. Like even to mm-hmm. this day, I'm like, he was a great guy. It was yeah. shitty. I broke his heart or whatever. Mm-hmm. That was terrible, but he was not my guy. Yeah, you're right. You're right. Mm-hmm. Oh, this is great. Okay. <laughs> We've got a second installment for Gianna Darling. Um, before I play that, remember to enter this week's giveaway, which is a signed paperback of her new release, Dangerous Temptation, which was out on Tuesday. That's her brand new release. It's called, like I said, Dangerous Temptations. It's an age gap, guardian ward, enemies to lovers, just mainline this shit to my veins <laughs> um in the podcast book that you're listening to right now is the prequel um in her standalone series called the fallen men and you can read them all that over so if you love this go get those yeah they're in audio and they're in um kindle unlimited yeah yeah so this is a great way to like taste young Durant. let me tell you the people People fucking love her books like i see people all the time make videos and like tiktoks yeah, they're and very- stuff like that I can tell from them, they're very tropey and cracky, like uh-huh. addictive kind of books. Yep. Yeah, that's exactly. So if you love this taste of Gianna Darling, you're definitely just go binge everything she's written. So let's play the second installment and we'll tell you on the other side who we've got next week. All right. See you guys there. Bye. Chapter three. I'd slept well, curled up at the base of mystery man Matt Broderick's hospital bed. It probably had something to do with the fact that for the first time, probably in my life, I felt safe. This strange man had taken a broken bottle to the face and lost an eye trying to protect me. I might not have known his name from his own lips or any details of his life or even personality beyond his awesome courage and unfailing bravery but I knew what kind of heart he had because he'd put it literally at risk to save a stranger. To save me. I felt his hand in my hair grow heavy as he fell asleep almost immediately after the bikers left. Carefully, I unraveled from the bed and slipped out the door to find something to soothe my growling stomach. I stared into the vending machine at the far end of the hall, deciding on a Mr. Big candy bar for Matt because the name was entirely suitable when the brisk clip of booted feet struck out against the linoleum down the hall perpendicular to mine. I recognized the police officer from the bar fight. I'd gotten in the back of the ambulance with Matt before they'd been able to question me, so I assumed he was there to get my statement. I was about to round the corner and reveal myself, when I caught sight of the blonde man who'd tried to buy me. Behind him came a beautiful Mexican man, young and fit, but entirely terrifying, and not just because his gun was visible under his coat. There was a blankness to his face that spoke of apathy and inherent cruelty. Goosebumps broke out over my skin, and I took an instinct step away, pressing my back to the vending machine with a Mr. Big candy bar clutched in my hand. This is not the auspicious beginning I was looking forward to, Jack, the cop said. His voice was clipped as he strode across the floor toward me. Both of you assured me that there would be no backlash on this community, yet the ink on this deal is barely dry, and I've got a maimed biker in a hospital and a local bar in disarray. The kids went off book. I shivered at the voice of my attacker. They're Ventura's boys, not mine. They are, the last man said, his accent lyrically Spanish, 
his tone dead flat. I will deal with them. I stopped breathing. There was a long pause. I waited for the policeman's sense of duty to kick in and his outrage to surface. How could any man in blue okay the murder of innocents? Last room at the end of the next hall, he finally muttered wearily, Wait until I'm gone to do it. Five minutes, the Mexican man countered, and I do it alone. I turned, dropped the candy bar, and ran. Panic turned my thoughts to static, but I flew to the nurse's station on instinct and ripped the landline telephone from behind the counter into my hands. Hey! An outraged nurse protested. I ignored her and read the label on the phone. Dial nine, then the room number for internal calls. Matt picked up on the second ring. Yeah. Hey, I said, watching as the beautiful assassin started toward me, toward the end of the hall where my beautiful, scarred hero lay vulnerable. It's me, Tayline. Tayline, he repeated, his voice like sandpaper smoothing out the syllables. Yeah, listen, the cop from the bar and the guy that attacked us, he's here, and they're sending a man to kill you, like, right now. Can you get out of the room without help? Fuck, he said, and then I heard the rustle of bedsheets as he got out of bed. Fuck, get out of here. I'm not just going to leave you, asshole, I told him. You saved my fucking life. Yeah, well, let's not make it worth shit, yeah? Get gone. Dial tone. Fuck. I stared at the annoyed nurse and cursed. Call the police. Something is going down in room 303. Hey, she called after me as I ran down the hall. The man was just disappearing into Matt's room. I didn't know what I would do when I got there. I just knew I couldn't let him die after all that. There was a coarse shout and then a gun discharged as I slid to a stop in the doorway. The would-be murderer and Matt were grappling for control of the gun until Matt slammed a heavy elbow into his nose and the weapon went flying into the wall and then skidded to the floor between them and myself. I blinked at it and then dove, the linoleum catching at my bare skin through my ripped jeans so that the flesh tore, but I didn't care. I could hear the sick thud of fists hitting bone, and I didn't know how long Matt could last in a fight, down one eye and exhausted from the trauma. The hot barrel of the gun scorched the tips of my fingers, so I fumbled it as I tried to adjust my grip. It was heavier than I would have thought, then again, I didn't know anything about guns. So, I just did what I'd seen people do in the movies, raising it with both hands, squinting slightly to try to aim at the man that was not Matt, and then I squeezed the trigger. I got him right in the ass. Matt didn't hesitate. He brought the groaning man down into his raised thigh and kneed him in the gonads, then pushed him to the ground. He swiped his leather jacket from the chair beside the bed and ran toward me shouting, Let's get the fuck out of here. He tagged my hand as if he'd held it every day for years and then propelled me out of the room with him. I still clutched the warm gun in my hand, wishing I knew how to turn the safety on as I raced after Matt into the emergency exit and down the stairs. He stumbled slightly as he turned the corners, his vision off, so I moved closer to guide him. We burst out of the door into the brilliant light of the midday sun and blinked the spots from our eyes. Only they weren't spots, but police lights flickering silently as cops pulled up and poured out of them. Fuck, Matt cursed, then clutched my hand tighter and swerved around the building to the back parking lot. Where the hell are you going? I panted. Where the cops ain't. You're in a hospital gown and your ass is showing, I told him, as if the sight of those two muscular orbs, pale against his tan and clenched tight as he ran, wasn't the loveliest sight I'd ever seen. We need to get somewhere private. 
He stopped running abruptly, swaying slightly as he stopped, his one good eye blinking hard against the dizziness. Fine. You lead. I grinned at him and darted to one of the older model cars in the first row of the parking lot. All I had left of my meager possessions were the clothes on my back and my wallet, which, thankfully, held my breaking and entering kit. I dug out the picks and went to work on the lock of the Prius. You can hotwire a car, he said from behind me, wry amusement and something kind of like pride in his voice. I can hotwire a car, I agreed, finishing the job with a satisfying click as I pulled the driver's side door open. Teenage runaway, I told him in explanation. Sure, he muttered as he rounded the car and got in the passenger side when I opened it for him. I could feel his eyes on me as I broke open the steering column and rewired the old system so the car started with a rumble and a purr. You take all your dates on rides like this, he asked. Last I checked, this wasn't a date, I told him, even though the thought thrilled me. I met you at any other bar on any other night, kitten. This would be our first date. Well then, I can't say I've hotwired a car, shot anyone, or gotten my man maimed on a date before. So I'm memorable already, he noted proudly. And somehow, after living through the absolute horror of the last 24 hours, I burst out laughing. Chapter 4 I signed us in to the cheap motel called Purgatory on the outskirts of Entrance B.C. as Mr. Big and Miss Little. It made Matt laugh, even though he was fading fast. I loved the sound of his laugh, rough and wild like the sound of stampeding mustangs. I wanted to help him to the far bed, especially when he accidentally bumped into the dresser on his way there, but he didn't seem like the kind of guy to accept help easily, so I left it. Then, not knowing what else to do, I sat down and stared at the man who'd lost an eye for me. I felt his sacrifice in my chest, like a hand clenched too tightly around my heart. It was the pressure of responsibility, the suffocation of guilt. You shouldn't have stepped in like that, I told him quietly, wanting to apologize, but I was out of practice at it. Don't make it out all hero-like, he muttered, each word heavy with exhaustion. Did it cause I liked the look he I in a way I couldn't ignore. So, what you're saying is, you're not a good guy and I'm pretty enough to warrant losing an eye over? I asked bemusedly, drawing my booted feet onto the mattress so I could hug my knees. There was such a long pause, I figured he had fallen asleep. And then, yeah, sounds about right. I giggled the sound tapering off as he finally moved, tipping his head to the side so he could see me out of his good right eye. There was tenderness in his craggy features that seemed at odds there, even as I thought it was the most beautiful thing I'd ever seen. She giggles, he muttered. Girl curls up like a kitten at the feet of a stranger, shoots guns and hot wires cars, and she giggles. I shrugged, not sure what that meant. He closed his eye as his lips twitched into a faint smile. Hard shell, soft and sweet candy center. I smiled into my knees and watched quietly as he fell asleep. I returned to the room laden with plastic shopping bags to find Matt sweating, grunting, and thrashing restlessly on the bed. Immediately, I dropped the goods and raced to his side, pressing my hand to his hot forehead, checking the damp gauze over his eye, slightly pink with blood. Matt, wake up, I shouted, jerking him by the broad shoulder. You're having a nightmare. He woke up with a snap, lurching to a seated position, his arms moving quickly to pin me against his chest as he rolled to the side, away from the door. At first... 
I thought he was attacking me, and my heart tripped with fear. Then, when one hand cradled the back of my head and he covered me with his big body, I realized that he was instinctually protecting me from some imagined threat. Shh, it's okay, Mr. Big, I murmured, stroking his damp hair back from his forehead gently. It's just me. You were having a nightmare. He peeled off me slightly, his good eye dazed with sleep and remembered dreams as he raked it down my body, checking me out for injuries. When he found me whole, he sighed gustily and dropped his head into my shoulder, careful not to hurt his eye. Dreamt I was too late, he growled into my hair. Didn't lose an eye, but you lost your face. Yikes, I said, and he let out an amused exhalation that was something like a laugh. Well, I'm fine, and we need to get you sorted, so why don't you get undressed while I start you a bath? He frowned at me, but let me squeeze out from under him and go to the pink-tiled bathroom to start the water running in the tub. God, this place was straight out of some Barbie-themed horror film. Matt followed me into the bathroom when the tub was nearly full, steam rolling off the water and fogging up the wide mirror over the sink. I had my makeshift medical paraphernalia set up on the closed toilet lid next to the bath, and there was an already soaped-up sponge in my hand, my jacket discarded, and my thermal sleeves rolled up so I could clean him. Get in, Mr. B., I said, narrowing my eyes at his still-clothed form. Lose the clothes. Was hoping the first time you saw me naked would be a fuck of a lot more romantic, he said, glaring at the bubbling bath water as if it was boiling lava. Didn't take you as the making love romantic type. He shifted his intense gaze to me. I'm not. My kind of romantic is getting naked and doing the horizontal tango. I laughed. Not sure you're up for that, buddy. Try me, he dared, and then he reached behind his neck to slowly peel his sweat-suctioned tea over his head. My mouth went dry at the sight of his abs, perfectly stacked boxes of hard muscle I wanted to climb with my tongue. A tattoo dipped down from his upper back onto both shoulders and down to cover his entire pectorals in an abstract array of green and blue ink. One of his nipples was pierced. Saliva pooled in my mouth at the thought of taking the silver barbell between my teeth. When I looked back up at his face, he was grinning. I cleared my throat and leveled him with a haughty look. Let's test that after we get you clean of blood and grime. He chuckled low in his throat and popped open the button of his jeans. I watched him slowly grasp and lower the zipper, then part the denim with both hands so he could lower them over his hips and down his thick, delicious thighs. It felt like someone was revealing a profound secret just for me, unearthing the answer to the question of life, and it lay nestled in the black boxer brief stretched tight around Matt's big body. He paused with the denim pooled at his feet, his fingers hooked in the waistband of his underwear, his stare hot like a hand at my throat. I tried to tell myself to calm down. A body was just a body, no matter how finely tuned. That Matt was fucking injured because of me, and it was my duty to nurse him back to health, not with the magic powers of my pussy, but with hot bath water and stolen medication but nothing I told myself changed the fact that watching Matt Broderick strip down in a steamy bathroom just inches from my flushed face was without a doubt the sexiest moment of my life. I held my breath as he slowly dipped the fabric over that hard V of muscles arrowing into his furred groin, and then I choked on a groan as his wonderfully thick, hard cock appeared. It was heavy, and swollen red at the tip with arousal, veins prominent in the dusky shaft that I wanted to explore with my tongue. 
He wasn't even touching me, and I felt on the edge of some kind of visual orgasm. My eyes stayed fixed on him as he moved forward and stepped into the scalding water with a soft hiss before lowering his oversized body into the tub. Water sloshed over the side as he settled, but I ignored it, my gaze transfixed by the sight of water running down his wide chest, glistening in his chest hair, before rolling down into the bubbles obscuring his beautiful cock. Work quick, he said gruffly, pulling my eyes to his. Or I'm hauling you into this tub with me and will do the tango wet. I shivered before I could quell the urge and then straighten my shoulders. Lean back and relax, I told him. He stared at me for a long moment before complying, tipping his head back against the rim and closing his eye. I hesitated, then stood up too quickly, shucked off my clothes before I stepped one foot in the tub and then the other on the opposite side of Matt's body, so I was straddling him. His eyes snapped open, blazing with heat, as I lowered myself onto his lower torso and settled there. His hands instantly went to my hips, his thumbs running over the string of my white bikini-style underwear. Be good, I scolded, but my voice was tight with arousal. Let me take care of you. Gently, I used the soft sponge to rub over the deep hills and narrow valleys of his muscular torso, worked my fingers into his stiff neck and up into his hair so I could carefully wash it without getting suds in his eyes. He let me tend to him. A giant sprawled in a tiny pink bathtub, his potential strength and intimidating energy lax, as if I'd tamed him like some wild animal with my soothing pets. When I peeled the gauze away, it was to find his bad eyes slightly bloody and weepy, the cuts starting just above his eyebrow, and angling all the way down into his beard. The wound was stitched closed, even his torn eyelid, but the eye itself was red, cloudy, and it looked totally beyond repair. My fingers lightly traced his sliced eyebrow, then down his cheek over his sharp, bearded jaw, before going to his mouth. His lips were full, the lower one plush, the color of the inside of a seashell so pale pink. I leaned down and pressed a kiss to that mouth, my gratitude and apology more eloquent on my tongue than they ever could be through my voice. Matt groaned and slanted his head to thrust his tongue between my lips. I sighed into his mouth as his arms went around me, curling me into his chest so that I felt surrounded by him, cocooned by him. I was safe and aroused, a bizarre combination that shouldn't have been so unbearably heady. Then we were moving. He shifted in the tub and stood quickly, his hands at my ass so he could carry me out of the bath. We were dripping wet, and his bad eye was uncovered, but he didn't seem to care as he kissed me and carried me over to the bed. He dropped on top of me softly, bracing his weight on his forearm so he wouldn't crush me with his huge build. Feeling romantic, Tayline, he warned me against my lips. The sound of my name and his rich voice shot a shiver straight down my spine to my pussy. I gasped as his head lowered to my chest, and his lips latched onto my nipple through the sheer material of my bralette. The sight of his big, dark head against my pale chest and the sharp pull of his lips and teeth against my sensitive flesh had me writhing in minutes. He soothed me with a hand striking down my side, slowly angling over my belly to cup my sex over my panties. Tastes so fucking sweet everywhere else. Gotta taste you here, he told me as he sat back on his knees and ripped my underwear down my legs. His stare was hot against my pussy as he lifted my hips high with his hands on my ass and brought me to his hungry mouth. 
I moaned long and low as his lips latched onto my core and his hot, slick tongue laved over my aching clit. He growled into my folds, shaking his head back and forth between my thighs so his beard abraded my skin deliciously and his tongue vibrated against my sweet spot. Fuck, I cursed, my legs straightening to hold back the epic climax threatening to snap my body in two. Matt, God, that feels too good. He didn't let up. Instead, he carted my body further into his lap, my hips canted high into the air so he could drink shamelessly from my center. I could hear the wet sound of his mouth on my pussy, the harsh rasp of his aroused breath as he ate at me relentlessly, and I knew I was going to come. One of Matt's hands left my ass, slicking up my damp inner thigh to sink two thick fingers in my snug cunt. I came apart. My body unraveled at the touch of his fingers, thoughts spilling out of my fractured mind, sensation unspooling through my blood until all that was left of me was the scattered remains of fabric and thread that had once held me together. Fuck. Gorgeous. I heard Matt curse, and then he was lowering my lips so I was draped over his thighs, and his searing hot cock was at my entrance. Look at me, he barked. Want to see you as I take you. My eyes snapped open and locked with his one-eyed gaze just as he powered his hips forward and impaled me on his huge cock. I cried out as pain-edged pleasure flooded my body, but I didn't take my eyes off his starkly aroused face, not even when he grasped my hips and started to go at me, hard. Look at that snug pink pussy wrapped so tight round my cock, he groaned, looking down at our connection. I lifted myself onto my elbows so I could see the obscene sight of his thick, dark cock slick with my cum stretching out my cunt. My head fell back on my shoulders as another orgasm sunk its teeth into my spine. Gonna come again? You wait for me, he told me. Hurry, I begged, my pussy already tightening, twitching, ready to detonate all around him. Look at me, he ordered again as one hand smoothed up the center of my body and rested over my left breast, over my heart. Want you to feel me. And I could. I could feel his eyes on me, the terrifying, glorious weight of his intent and intense affection behind them, the heavy brand of his hand over my heart and the thick surge of him between my thighs. He was everywhere, in me, on me, around me. In that moment, he was mine. Yeah, he rasped somehow reading my thoughts. Fucking yeah. And when we came, we did it together. Chapter 5 Later, I lay with him in the near dark, only the flickering gray light of the muted TV casting pale shadows over the bed. There's a word in Spanish for a man like you, I told him. Tuerto is a one-eyed man. We don't have a word for that in English. We do. Cyclops. He deadpanned. I hit him in the shoulder, then traced the pattern of his tattoos there, distracted by their beauty and the stunning cut of his muscles below that. Cyclops. Well, it's definitely more original than Matt. What's wrong with my name? I shrugged one shoulder. It's just so normal. You are not a normal man. His gaze seared into me, and he pulled me tighter on top of him with the arm at my hip so that he could speak against my lips when he said, You are not a normal woman. More like a fucking dream. A very bad one. 
I corrected, my fingers soft with apology against his freshly gauze-wrapped left eye. I might have had sight through both eyes before I met you, but I'm telling you this in a real way that has nothing to do with your guilt or me wanting to make you feel better and every fucking thing to do with the truth. In a lot of ways, I was blinder last week than I am today. Yeah? I asked. How's that? Was living life on autopilot. Stopped pausing to see the beauty and the possibilities laid out for me. Man loses an eye, comes that close to a dirty kind of death. He sees things differently than he used to. Tell me yours, I'll tell you mine, I whispered, desperate to understand every inch of him in a way I'd never felt before. His broad fingers played with one of my small hands, tracing over each slim digit, mapping the veins in my wrist and the lines cutting through my palms. There was an intensity to everything he did with me, for me, as if he was an ardent scholar and I was every script, scroll, and verse he ever wanted to read. I'd never had anyone pay attention to me, let alone to the depths and clarity of Matt's attentiveness. It should have disturbed me, rubbed me raw like some collar on the wildness of my free spirit. Instead, it settled something restless in my chest, a beast that yearned for pack, but had never found one. Don't really got much to tell, kitten, but I'll tell it. Mum died of breast cancer when I was three. Dad was an alcoholic piece of shit. Never made many friends back home, cause he had a reputation as a crook, which meant so did I, even young as twelve. Got the fuck out of Newfoundland and been riding nomad ever since. Young, wild, and free, I surmised. Same as me. His hand tightened at my hip. Got a feeling we're cut from the same kind of cloth. Yeah. I agreed softly, loving that because I'd never had it before. My story starts different, but ends the same. Parents died in a wreck when I was three, went into foster care, never found a good home. Run away until running away became my whole life. Back in Canada after four years in Europe bumming around and learning French and Spanish. He was quiet for a while his coarse fingers running patterns over the skin of my ass. You ever want the home? He finally asked. His words cracked open the lid of desire I'd kept screwed tightly shut in the center of my chest. I took a deep breath and let it out. Yeah, sure. You? Home can be a person or place never found either worth staying put for, he replied, feeling me stiffen beside him. Thinking that's changed now. Yeah? I asked, as if my heart wasn't in my throat, as if hope wasn't clogging my airways. We figure out what to do about this Mexican who wants to see us dead? I'm thinking, fuck yeah. Try this place. It doesn't suit. Move on like normal. Just doing it together. Together. The word raced on the track of my mind, lap after lap. What are we going to do about the guy? I asked, instead of confirming, because I was chicken shit. Matt tensed around me, then rolled us both to the side of the bed so he could reach into his jacket and come back with the phone in his hand. Stole this from him. Figure, the second we turn it on, he'll find us. And then? His grin was a slow slice across his face. We set him up. Early morning fog rolled in diaphanous clouds off the ocean through the streets of entrance and into the huge, snowed-over asphalt parking lot of Evergreen Gas Station. 
We chose the gas station because it was close enough to town to draw attention if things went backward, but far enough we wouldn't risk engaging any innocent civilians. Matt had made calls to set everything in motion even early this morning while I showered and tried to brace for carnage. A car pulled up to the front of the station, a nondescript black Volvo that wouldn't usually draw attention except for the fact that it was 5.30 a.m. on a Sunday and no one should be pulling up for gas. I glanced at the clock on the dash, my knee bouncing with pent-up nerves. I wasn't supposed to follow him into the station unless he didn't return for more than 15 minutes, but when the black Volvo remained idling at a pump for five minutes without anyone getting out, I started to get worried. I'd just unlocked to check it out when two things happened. The idling Volvo's wheels screeched against the pavement before it went driving straight through the front glass wall of the gas station, and someone yanked open the door I'd just unlocked and ripped me from the car. Hey, bitch, Harry's voice greeted me, his hot breath in my air as he dragged me across the lot toward the gas station where the sound of gunfire could be heard. Miss me? How the fuck did you get out of jail? I demanded, writhing in his hold even though he had a gun pressed to my back and a tight grip on my hair. Cartel's got money, pretty thing. I made bail and thought, what would make my freedom taste even more sweet? The blood of the bitch that tried to fucking end me. He pushed open the back door to the store and dragged me down the short hall to the main room where the Volvo dangled half in, half out of the store and Matt was pressed against the far left wall, exchanging gunfire with three Mexican cartel agents at the front. Hey, one-eyed guy, Harry called. Just in case you can't see me over here with your pretty little girlfriend, I got her jammed up nice and close to the end of my gun. Matt froze his gun still cocked, even though his head swiveled to face us. Look, I'm sure we can figure something out, he tried to ration. Harry laughed. Yeah, fucking right you'd say that. Looks to me you got nothing to bargain with. Matt's panicked face tensed, then slowly broke open into a cutting grin. You so sure about that? The rolling thunder of Harley-Davidson motorcycle pipes crusted through the shattered glass and vibrated the broken pieces littering the ground. A second later, through the fog, the bikers appeared, black leather Avengers wearing the patch of fallen angels. Gunfire erupted. I dropped to the ground in Harry's suddenly lax arms and watched a moment later as he fell backwards with a shot to his head, his eyes wide and dull with death even as he fell. His gun dropped with a clatter and discharged, the shot brushing so close by my shoulder I could feel the sting of air as it passed. Without thinking, I grabbed the hot barrel and curled my fingers over it before I started scrambling along the linoleum floor toward where I thought Matt would be. Twinkies and Lay's chip bags exploded on the shelves above me and the roar of fighting bikers punctured the air along with bullets. Matt, I screamed, and he was there, facing away from me, his head caught in the locked arms of the same man who'd tried to kill him in the hospital, the one I'd shot in the ass. He was trying to fight the hold, but there was a gun in the other man's hand that was pressed precariously close to his temple. No, no death, no dying, not for my cyclops. I jumped to my feet, even though gunfire hailed all around me, and screamed to draw his attention away from Matt as I ran towards them, gun raised. The beautiful assassin turned to me, his gun already moving to follow his gaze so he could kill me. I killed him first. My finger pulled the trigger of the gun once, twice, three times, because I didn't know what I was doing and I wanted to be sure. The first bullet caught his outside shoulder because I didn't want to aim too close to Matt. The next missed him entirely. But the third? The third got him right in the center of his chest. 
Matt spun around on his knees and shoved the guy to the ground, drilling another bullet straight into his skull, even though he was already dead. I got him, I whispered, as the gunfire slowed and ceased completely. I swayed on my feet as I stared at the blood spreading into a black-red, unctuous pool beneath the dead boy. Matt caught me as I fell forward, and he easily picked me up into his arms as someone shouted his name from the front of the store. I could feel the tension of adrenaline turning his muscles to iron as he strode over the debris and threw the blood to the shattered front door. You too good? We're good, thanks to you, I told the prez, Zeus Garo, a man bigger than any I'd ever seen before. He grinned as he flexed his bloody knuckles, a badly beaten unconscious cartel man at his feet. Happy to help rid the streets of entrance from this kind of filth. Strong words from an outlaw, I noted. Zeus laughed, then sobered quickly. Yeah, well, there's a fucking big difference between growing and selling weed and stealing and selling women. Touché. Thanks again for the help, Matt said, tipping his chin in that solemn way men did to convey the intensity of their sentiment. Zeus repeated the action. Like I said, man, it was our fucking pleasure. We're heading out. That don't mean what I said for in the hospital don't still stand. You want a place in the fallen? You're willing to prospect? We'd be fucking lucky to have a man like you to call a brother. Matt stared at him for a moment, then looked down at me, reading something in my eyes that I knew was mirrored in his own. Yeah he finally said, his voice strong and sure, even though I knew he must have been nervous to commit when we weren't the kind of people to commit to anything. Yeah, girl, I'd like that. Zeus's handsome face split into a wide grin. Fuck yeah, so would I. Come by the clubhouse after this gets sorted, and we'll see about replacing that piece of shit leather jacket with something a far sight fucking better. Matt nodded and watched together as the group of five bikers all moved together to swing their legs over their bikes and ride out of there in formation. I watched them go, loving the sight of the wind in their hair, loving that Matt and me would be a part of something that meant family and still gave us our freedom. Matt turned and carried us back into the store to wait for the cops, our story already fine-tuned from before the incident. I gasped when Matt pushed me up against a wall at the back of the store and fisted a hand in the back of my short hair. His eyes burned with fire. The heat of relief and the eclectic burn of adrenaline turned to desire. I knew the second before he kissed me that he was going to light me on fire too. I groaned into his mouth as he plundered it, his hand already between my legs, working at my jeans nimbly until they were undone and his hand could slide inside, finger to my clit. I rocked against his hand, feeling his erection against my inner thigh, my pussy already wet through my panties. I pushed him away hard with two hands so I could rip open his jeans and tear them down his thighs. My knees had barely hit the ground before I had my hand in his boxer briefs tugging out his hard cock and my mouth was sealed over the hot tip. He let me suck him for a long minute, his hand braced on the wall over my head, his chin ducked into his chest so he could watch my red lips move over the flared head of his cock. I hummed over him as he hit the back of my throat. And then I swallowed hard, dragging his big dick down my throat. Fuck, he cursed, then used my hair to drag me off his cock. He sunk to the floor beside me, tore my jeans down my legs, snapped my panties off with a quick tug, and then sunk his cock deep to the root inside me. I was still sore from the stretch of him the night before, but I love the ache and burn of him. It reminded me that he was real, not some long-forgotten dream I'd cooked up then thrown out as a kid, 
but a real flesh and blood man that wanted me to be his, that wanted to do something as beautiful and tangible as lay down roots with me. A stray bullet must have hit the gas station stereo because all I want for Christmas was playing on repeat over the drone of the drink fridges and the whistle of winter wind streaming through the broken glass door. The linoleum was cold, the blood pooled over it warm, and Matt's skin was almost unbearably hot against my own. I stared up at him as he fucked me on the floor of the gas station, his hand tight around my throat, his big cock inside me, and I knew I'd kill a thousand more men if it meant keeping him with me for eternity. Feel like fucking home, he growled into my ear as he wrapped himself tight around me and came, flooding me with warmth. Yeah, I gasped as I came too, feeling him safe and warm on top of me, more of a shield than any roof could be, more family than anyone had ever been, and I'd only known him for four days. Fucking home. This has been Out of Sight by Gianna Darling. Narrated by Jack Callahan. Welcome back. Hey, lady listeners. Thanks so much, Gianna, for being with us this week. We really appreciate you letting us play out of sight. Um, you know, she was such a sweetheart. She was so, so nice when she was sitting in her book and everything. So it was really great to have her on here. Um, up next week, we had Trelina Pucci, and I am ecstatic to have her on here because I can't wait to talk about her fucking book. She texted me two days ago and said it's almost finished with the editor. She said, we're literally doing chapter by chapter edits. And she said, I'm giving her a chapter. She's, she's editing it, sending it to the prover, then the prover sending it to the formatter. And she was <laughs> like, we're just a big loop right now. And she said, I've got like four chapters left. Awesome. So yeah. So I'm super excited to read that. So. All right. I guess that's it then. I'm going to see you guys next week. Tell them what to do. Fuck your day up. Make today your bitch. Don't be a dick. Bye, guys. Bye. Read me romance. Read, read me romance. Read me romance.